of my favorite author of my youth, they are uh, the Chardin. Uh, uh, he's disliked uh, uh, by historians because he's considered uh, as a Hegelian. <laughs> but I remembered him uh, this afternoon because he talks about the beauty of the world. Uh, he talks about the beauty of the universe yeah, and, uh, and so on. And uh, he can be included in the series of the names uh, like Balthazar and Dostoevsky and Tirik and so on and so on. And it is, uh, it is special beautiful for me, which is probably due to the, to the that this place as a, as a spiritus loci. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to comment on it, Anne-Marie? Thank you very much. Yes, Teilhard is sometimes unfairly discarded. Uh, it is true that there are passages in his work which after our turn to history and theology, that is a theology uh, after the Shoah, uh, can be a little bit shocking with, you know, with, with the hindsight that we have, which is also always 2020 vision. Um, he, for instance, really um, almost um, puts aside the tragedy of, of the battle of the battles, saying the wars and um, um, the, the tragic battles of history will, in the end, be subsumed in the in the Omega. So that, indeed, is a position which today is no longer really received. Um, but what is so beautiful in Taya and which then tends to be forgotten, you're very right to bring him back into the discussion, is for instance, when he says uh, mass uh, on the world. Um, and, and so it's, it's what Olivier Clément will call the Eucharistification. I was glad to say that, to be able to say that, the Eucharistification <laughs> of the cosmos. So nature and sacrament, um, that sacramental sense of beauty, which is lacking in so many of our discourses, where beauty is, becomes just another topic, and uh, we can't really bother too much by it because we, we, we are logocentric. And uh, so Teilhard de Chardin, in that sense, is certainly a reservoir yet to be discovered. Thank you. Uh, uh, and maybe I will comment also the, the lecture of uh, both Yeri and Anne-Marie. Uh, I was quite taken, Yeri, when you spoke about the surrender. Uh, and uh, I was reminded then of St. Ignatius of Loyola, who in his spiritual exercises emphasizes the importance of the principle agere contra, act against. Support the weaker so that it's stronger, act the opposite way. And uh, when you, Anne-Marie, spoke about the predictability and the paradox, I think you did just exactly that, that uh, you uh, surrendered to the predictability, to the nature to what is weaker usually in Protestant theology. I think what I keep thinking about uh, is taking, going back to your numbers. What is the search? And if we move from the binary uh, to the trinitary understanding, what would be the third surrender that needs to be made? And this is maybe a question to you both. Easy one. <laughs> It's the forgotten dimension, as Paul Tillich said famously. And um, it's interesting to me, at least, that um, the very latest uh, um, research group, you know, which is very, um, you'd think that we'd be looking for the newest in, um, of the newest topics to find something that is 
never been seen before, that other um, theologians had not done. So here at, at my university in Paris, which is the Institut Catholique, we have um, a group of uh, philosophers and theologians who work together. And the newest of the newest topics that we are starting next week is um, uh, f um, the forgetfulness of the soul. The f forgetting the soul. So that is maybe, um, again, a blind spot. Um, it is not at all new, it is in fact very old. And again, it's not a working concept in, in Protestant the theology. I think you could spend an entire career as a theologian, no one would notice it, that you never speak about the soul. Because you can speak about the mind, you can speak about the spirit, you can speak about the spirit, the Holy Spirit, but no one would say, but what about the soul? And even in German, we do have the word Seelsorge, which is, sounds very, you know, taking care of the soul, uh, which when you say it in English doesn't work at all. It sounds very old fashioned. What is the soul? Who has ever seen a soul? Have you seen a soul? No. Have you seen a soul? Well, but you're an artist and you're a visionary. You're not the middle of the road. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeti. Yeah, it is a very serious theme. It is a very serious um, question. We have forgotten the soul, forgotten the human mind, forgotten the human, maybe body and mind. It's so human. Um, yeah, it, to me, as a historian... Let us not forget the, we ha have had the strange, the very terrible 20th century about forgotten the soul, about forgotten the mind, of human mind. Uh, and we have had ideologies and regimes against the human mind, against the human soul. And it is, to me, it's very difficult to speak about beauty in this sense, because uh, Italian fascism or, or German Nazism at the beginning spoke about harmony, about a special kind of human mind, uh, a, new, a new kind of human existence. So to me it's very dangerous place. Yeah. Thank you. So we can open again the questions to you for questions or comments. Please, Paula. Oh. Again, the basic question, because I'm, I'm not a theologian and I'm not a philosopher. I just research on the fathers of the church. And um, you said that beauty is more primordial and transcends aesthetics. I, I would have these two concepts overlapping, uh, beauty and aesthetics, but why do you say that they do not overlap? I mean, it's a very, very basic question, <laughs> very simple one. Up, but they are not the same. And the difference is really important to me. When I say that beauty is more primordial, uh, I would say, uh, if I make a comparison, uh, this would be like religious experience and theology. That religious experience is primary and theology is secondary because it reflects on something that is already here or it just speculates. And this is why I spoke about the kitsch that has no relationship to reality. Uh, and I think similarly, uh, aesthetics is secondary. It is not primary and it is often postulated as primary, which I think is a huge problem. This is where aesthetics, I think, is getting into a ditch, according to my understanding. 
and this is when it, it becomes uh, circular and the real life doesn't get in. This is why I said that beauty is more primary. Uh, and uh, the experience of beauty and the experience of aesthetics are not the same. Don't get me wrong, I am not against aesthetics. And uh, I have a lot of time for aesthetics and uh, uh, in different aspects of my life. Uh, but these are not the same. And I was still thinking when Yeji was speaking, uh, and when Yeji said that uh, beauty is a historical category, and I was thinking, oh, is it? And uh, isn't it that aesthetics is a historical category? And isn't beauty both uh, historical and ahistorical or transhistorical? Uh, and then I think when he spoke about this place and going through the uh, other uh, ways uh, to the theme, uh, I was thinking maybe it is, but maybe he would you like to say something to that? Well, have I answered your question, Paula? Okay, Yeji. Yeah, I would like to say that I am a defender of kitsch. <laughs> yeah. But, but I agree, it's not the same, the beauty and, and uh, aesthetics, yeah, yeah, uh, I agree. But uh, I, I will to say that cage is about relationship, about the relationship between man and, for example, some picture, not illusion, some reality. For example, I know people, they have an awful picture on the wall, yeah? But the deep relationship with them. According to Adorno, this would not be a kitsch. Uh, I think the kitsch is really what lacks the relationship to reality and leads to copying. And it's not about ugliness or beauty. It's interesting that in the old iconographical rules, uh, for example, the icon can be done uh, by somebody who doesn't have a training in the art. And in many ways, it could be very naive or in some sense, aesthetic sense, even ugly. But it still would have the original relationship uh, to the experience and the depiction. And there would be people who would have uh, uh, deers in nature on the wall. And for them, this would not be a catch because their relationship to that would not be of that kind. And even a local artist who would create these things, which would be offensive to my aesthetics, uh, would not be necessarily a catch. This is where you have a different, uh, I think, categories. But Anne-Marie. Well, this is a very interesting discussion. Um, and it makes me think of um, uh, the beauty of art brut, the, the art that is produced by people who don't know the rules, uh, children, uh, people who are officially insane. But um, my question was about, um, do we in this room, could we stop and think for one second about what it means to never be in the presence of a famous painting without having seen that picture already in your telephone millions of times. You see, I was struck by that quote that, that, that you remind us of, Ivana, uh, of Paul Tillich. Paul Tillich writes about this experience because he had literally never seen that Botticelli or maybe no Botticelli. So that permitted that painting to break through and to really become like a, an epiphany. But for us, we have seen so, and you, 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 you ask your phone Botticelli and you have a gallery of, of more or less good pictures of Botticelli. So our sense of beauty has, I'm sure, become at more, um, on the one hand, better informed, more informed, but maybe lacks the freshness of what uh, Chesterton talks about in The Everlasting Man, which is a beautiful little book. He says, it's really only the child that sees truly, and the only real seeing is seeing for the first time. And he also, Chesterton talks about the chap who who goes out and then he looks back and he sees his own garden and his house and his garden. 
and he discovers that there is a painting on the hill. It's a white giant, but he had never seen it because you know he can't see it in his garden. He had to be removed. And then all of a sudden, he saw that pattern, uh, the white giant, because there are hills in England uh, which have mysterious large-scale paintings, which now we have to see with airplanes. And you, you wonder how people drew them because they couldn't see what they were doing. But anyway, the shock of seeing something beautiful for the first time, that is something that we really have to look for. And there we live in a world of kitsch and camp and you can't fight it. I think you just have to go with the flow. I think you can fight it. And uh, I think one of the things, uh, one of the reasons perhaps for meditation, contemplation, uh, uh, breathing, spiritual practices and other things are so popular now is also because we need to learn things anew as if for the first time. And in a way this is harder, uh, but uh, it's only partly through the training and partly it's both, and partly it is through the surprise that sometimes you see a new things which you were passing by so often, and this new light is still possible. And I think the, uh, there, there is an epiphanic quality to beauty, which can break through the known, whether paradox or other. Uh, but I think in that I would have hope Of all. Thank you very much to all three of the speakers. I really enjoyed the richness of your talks and how stimulating they were. Um, I was trying to uh, find something that for me would be connecting uh, in, your, in your talks, and I don't know if you will agree with me, but in, in Ivana's talk, I, appre I mean, I appreciated many things, all three of your talks, but I'll just mention a couple of, uh, one thing for, for each of the talks. Uh, Ivana, I really liked when you spoke about how beauty uh, relates to the mystery of life, for example, how we encounter it in Christian faith, how beauty mediates joy. In Iji's talk, I appreciated uh, the emphasis on constructive imagination, how we are to call to create stories and in, in Anna Marie's talk, I appreciated the emphasis on the paradox in breaking of the unexpected and, and the unknown. And so the connecting points, the connecting category for me is the category of desire here. Our human desire for something that is not here yet, but we somehow feel perhaps or uh, hope that there should be something here which is not here yet, and that is that eschatological outlook, for example, in our Christian faith. And perhaps that also relates to uh, what has been said earlier in this discussion about uh, what we have forgotten about, about the, this, this soul. So these dimensions of, of desire that us as embodied beings, I think all three of you mentioned that we are um, embodied of human embodiment of em embodied state of a human a human being so that's the dimension so I'm not going to put it in a question it's just just a comment on importance of desire I think uh, thank, thank you thank you very much uh, do people want to reflect on that comment I will also very briefly just state that um, your comments makes perfect sense it, you may have discovered or um, made explicit what is in fact the, 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 the tie, the connection between the three approaches. Um, yours very critical, your narrative and mine, I mean, maybe both um, um, in the cosmos and in, and in the, the cross. So it's the desire, it's that erotic uh, in the platonic term uh, sense. Uh, the desire for the world that may be the golden age or um, uh, the return to a prelapsarian state or um, the kingdom, because we haven't spoken much about uh, the kingdom and the beauty of the kingdom to come. So thank you. 
Thank you. Maybe if I may uh, continue to that. I don't know whether for me this would be desire. I think that desire plays a very important role in my spiritual life and sometimes I feel too important. And uh, I think what comes to my mind would be something like desire nothing and hope all. And that uh, uh, if you have only desire, you get always frustrated. Even our desire for justice, for truth, for beauty. Uh, we are, I think, created in the way that we are incapable of being completely without these desires. But then I think at the end of the road, there is also an element of surprise, the inbreaking, which Anne Marie was talking about. And I think for me, the notion of hope would be perhaps uniting the desire and that which you are no longer capable of desiring. It reminds me of Jakub Demmel, who in his short novella, Forgotten Light, uh, on which base the film Forgotten Light was made, uh, he says there, even in times where it is impossible for us even to hope, he says, we still can laugh. And there would be, I think, various uh, images in literature, perhaps better in literature than in the sciences quite often, uh, that would speak about the uh, situation where you can go that way no further, but the other reveals itself. Yeah, I have only a small comment to you. Yeah, I spoke about a modern era, about desire and, uh, and <coughs> maybe imagination in the society, in the society in the modern era, and uh, also uh, about the historians, the, uh, they reflect this modern type of society. But um, Anne-Marie uh, uh, connected me with my youth because, because I like uh, Théodore de Chardin and the second connection, thanks to you, is with uh, Gilbert K. Chesterton. And uh, I like very much one of, uh, um, one of his sentence about use, about, uh, about our imagination and about connection between imagination and relationship to the reality and to our dreams. Gilbert K. Chesterton spoke about a young boy, about six years old, and the boy opens the door and then uh, he, he, he can see a dragon. It's very nice. But the younger boy, about three years ago, he opens the door and it is, it is all, it is enough. <laughs> whole beauty, whole imagination is in the opening the door. <laughs> ah, thank you. One more comment to Chesterton before I give it to Tim. Uh, I remembered uh, a, a story where it says, what is the difference between a poet and a philosopher? A poet has his head in the skies and the philosopher tries to get the skies into the head. And what breaks is the head. Tim. Thank you. Um, thank you all for uh, your talks. Um, it, probably for, for, for all of you, I think. I was very struck year to you by what you were saying about the, the, the importance of kind of narrative history. And to cheer you up, but theologians also read something useful sometimes. <laughs> my books are by my bedside. I have one, one at the moment, the two I'm reading. One is on history, where it's uh, by Norman Davis, um, who writes very beautifully. And the other is a history of time. It's about time by a, an Italian um, quantum physicist. Um, Ravelli. Ravelli, yeah. And I'm, I'm really enjoying, and that's also a very beautiful book. Um, 
And it does strike me, maybe a question is, how much do we think about beauty when we write? I mean, as academics in our, in our, in our work, how much emphasis do we put on writing something that's beautiful? Because I think often we forget about that. And it, it seems to me actually quite an important dimension of, of articulation of, any, of the truth that we want to articulate must necessarily be beautiful. Um, or maybe it mustn't necessarily be beautiful, but should it be beautiful, maybe is the question. About the lunchbox, I did not invent. I, I mean, I invented it in the sense of I found it, I saw it, I discovered both the decay, which really shocked me because it had been in the fridge, but we've had very hot temperatures in Paris. And then, but then I looked at it and I thought it was beautiful. There was a cloud of mushrooms and the, um, the eggplant had, had grown beads uh, like pearls. <laughs> and so there we are in the paradox. It's in a way, uh, decay, it's no longer really edible, at least for me, but it's new life. And um, I think many microorganisms have worked together to make that um, you know, new lunchbox. So <laughs> it, it was in a way really, I was, you, know, you have of course uh, um, uh, recognized the quote of uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, surprised by joy, you can also be surprised by decay. It's not of the same order, but it's, there's the same quality about it, maybe, which is the unforeseen. And my second point, if I may, about the soundtrack that wasn't very audible, but we can share the clip and you can hear it. I found only after choosing the music that Motlidwa in Polish means prayer. And I know the composer extremely well. She's a very good friend of mine. She's Roxana Panufnik. She's, she started life as the daughter of, she was the daughter of a famous Polish composer, Panufnik, Andrzej Panufnik. But now she has become Roxana Panufnik, a composer. Um, I really recommend her music to you. It's fascinating. She's a truly Jewish Christian composer because her mother uh, uh, was Jewish and her father was a Catholic from Poland. So, sh And she is both. She's not half-half. She's both. And in her music that transpires, it's a beautiful, sacred music for today. What I wanted to say is that it took her some time to dare take an unfinished musical piece by her father and to say, I am, I am going to finish this. May I finish this? Do I have the right to do this? And she struggled for it for many days. And, and then she had a dream. And in her dream, her father, who uh, I remind you, he's dead huh? by this time. And her father pushes a, a, a piano stool under the piano and makes, beckons her towards that stool of the piano. And she, Roxana, understands in this moment and she really takes on the mantle of her father's uh, composing genius and becomes a composer herself. So that is a beautiful story, I think, that sometimes we also need to be aware of someone who is pushing us without force, without violence, but nudging us to become something uh, which we ourselves don't see or we don't believe in, and, but they see it. They see that, they can, that we can do it. That's the story of Roxana Padnufnik. Thank you. Thank you for the beautiful story of the soul, just as we were talking about before. The soul that is relational and not individual, the forgotten third. Uh, I think that I get, as the older I get, the more frustrated I get with some theology and philosophy. 
I mean, I have shared some of my critical frustrations with you, but believe me, there is more of them. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think the absent beauty and the boredom of many books. I just get bored. Uh, it probably, it may move me out <laughs> of the business at some point, I don't know. But I am thinking of the church uh, fathers quite often and how poetry was important for them. And uh, you have uh, Gregory de Nazianzen or, or Simeon, the new theologian, and part of their works will be written in poetry at least, and it doesn't have to be in stanzas, it's the language of poetry. Or you can have even the prologue to John's Gospel, one of the beauty that we have seen so often that we have forgotten how beautiful it is sometimes. And I think it's, a, for me, a necessary return point, but also a necessary invitation to which I feel that I may never measure up, but here is the desire at least to try. Uh, to Tim, one small regard, remark. So uh, I, yeah, it's against postmodern theory, but for historians, for his, for history and for historian, right historians, um, it is it is necessary to think and write about truth. It is so. It is clear. Truth is the main thing, not beauty. Truth. But, <laughs> um, but I remembered. I I reminded one sentence from the gospel, to, to think and to write about truth, and the others will be ad edit, edited, so maybe beauty as well. <laughs> yeah. I think we circulate around the Trinity, uh, goodness, well, <laughs> there is four of them, <laughs> goodness, uh, truth, justice, beauty, and I think none of them are either or option. Uh, but uh, what is contextual, that what has been undernourished and uh, underdimensioned uh, needs perhaps bigger attention. Uh, and I think in history you are right about the truth. In theology you cannot give truth or justice or goodness. You can't give it up. But it doesn't mean that we can ignore beauty. And sometimes it, it's like maybe with virtues and Francis of Assisi says that if you gain one virtue and you don't offend the others, you have them all. But sometimes we need to remind ourselves what is the whole spectrum of the whole. Because sometimes the forgotten door is perhaps the door through which we can enter to the new place. The theologians that, that I read with pleasure are the ones who were able to write beautifully and their work has gone through the centuries. And um, there is a triad there for me, which is actually four. <laughs> we'll start a little tradition here of um, a quaternity. Um, one, as I mentioned, is of course Augustine uh, there is not a paragraph in Augustine which I think is boring. And his most beautiful work is just sets a standard which, uh, which will be for the ages. And uh, often I think that our theology is a footnote to Augustine. There are not many things that he has not touched upon and in such a beautiful way. And um, the second one is, is um, Luther. The third is Calvin in French, and um, and Paul Tillich in his sermons is a powerful uh, writer. I think of the sermon which I almost quoted and didn't, which is called Holy Waste. Holy Waste is a beautiful sermon. Um, I think you can even try it on Sunday on your congregation and it will fly. <laughs> Thank you. More questions or comments or poems, please.
two minutes. Uh, I would like to get back to Anna Marie uh, idea of complexity of human brain and complexity of the universe because it reminds me that maybe and this is actually my question if uh, our sense of beauty is dependent on that complexity of our brain which is actually the complexity of the universe are we the universe is, is the why we perceive beauty of the universe that is a very complex question uh, it's yes and no. Um, the instrument through which we perceive the universe is the brain, maybe the soul, um, and certainly the body. So in a sense, we are the measure. But of course, in the other w sense, we are not the measure, since the cosmos precedes us and will uh, survive us. Um, so it's a yes and no answer. <laughs> Sick at none. <laughs> Thank you. And the soul and body calls. So I will ask you now just to stretch a bit. Well, first of all, thank you to uh, my colleagues.